Ah, yes, now we are back in the comic book store. You are listening to Comic Stripped, the podcast that compares the source material, the comic book, to the movie or television show. I'm your host, the mandated reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Radledge. And this is an extra special edition of Comic Stripped. It's the Super Blog Team Up. And we've got a Super Blog Team Up panel of guests here. First, from the Source Material podcast, he's got his own Superblog team-up thing going on. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the disapproving dad, Mr. Essential, Jesse Starcher. How do you do, sir? Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, let's just say that I aim, and I'm sure you do as well, Mark Radlich, to keep this podcast PG-rated. Not Logan's <laughs> Run PG-rated, but... <laughs> Podcast PG rated, YouTube PG rated. PG rated uh, we're going to so. keep it as rated as I saw Logan's run. Very <laughs> PG. <laughs> so unseen. Unseen. <laughs> so if there's something inappropriate, Mark will not be aware of it. That is correct. <laughs> um, it's like it's like when I used to go out drinking with my friends at the bar. Like, oh, some girl took her top off. Where? <laughs> and I never would never see it. Uh, also uh, joining us here tonight. Participating in the Superblog team up is Evan Bevins. How do you do, sir? Doing good, Mark. Glad to have you here. And oh my God, it's a run in. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Alice Adana was like, Are you talking Logan's run? Well, that I'm talking Logan's run. And he came in and he hit me over the head with a chair and he said, NWO, DTA, other McCavity, things. McCavity, <laughs> McCavity. McCavity, other things wrestlers said. Ladies and gentlemen, yes. From the Resurrections uh, Thanos and Warlock podcast, it's Al Sedano. How do you do, sir? I'm good. What's going on? Besides you missing everything. You were <laughs> like how I wish my parents were always be. Just miss all the inappropriate stuff that's happening and just let me watch what I want to watch. <laughs> it is amazing. Your uh, kids are lucky. God. You know, you would think a guy that like would review movies would have a keen sense of what's happening in the movie. But nope, stuff, just stuff gets right past me. Like, like a bad goalie in a hockey team. All right. So the reason why we're doing this tonight is I, I mentioned the Superblog team up. The Superblog team up is something that Chris Bailey, Chris Bailey, Chris Bailey uh, put together. He does the superhero satellite and he put together a bunch of bloggers and podcasters and whatnot. And he said, hey, once a quarter or so, we're going to pick a topic and we're all going to participate, you know, do something, your blog or a podcast, um, at least tangentially related to that topic. And then we'll all promote each other's stuff and we'll, you know, and a rising tide lifts all ships. And um, we recently, had an announcement by George Perez about his health, which made us all reflect on his life and times and great works. And it was decided that this quarter's Superblog team up was going to be a celebration of the life and works of the great George Perez. And so here we are. And as it turns out, as I was looking through George Perez's stuff, you know, sure, the low hanging fruit was Teen Titans and, you know, the, many other popular comic book things. And I went, Logan's Run, <laughs> the five issues that he did for marvel comics um an adaptation of the movie logan's run based on the novel and i'm like that's what i want to talk about because i've actually never seen logan's run apparently even when i watched it i didn't see <laughs> <Logan's Run. laughs> uh so that's what we're talking about here and i'll um i'll start off with you jesse what does george perez mean to you well uh, i mean when you hear the name you think immediately of uh, some of the fantastic comic book art that he's put out there uh you mentioned teen titans uh there is a very uh, uh you know a warm place in my heart for what he did on infinity gauntlet uh crisis on infinite earths uh, it's the the list goes on and on uh but what a lot of what i've heard is and when I think of George Perez is, you know, it's, it's about being a decent guy. Uh, you know, this, he is quintessentially one of the best comic book artists out there, but try to find a bad story about George. It's nearly impossible. Uh, and that to me speaks a lot more volumes. Uh, uh you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's something else to be very good and very talented at what you do and also have a great attitude towards life and towards others. Uh, and it, that's, I think, what puts him in the upper echelon of not just uh, a talented artist, but of people. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it, it just generally being a good guy is, is going to get you there. 
Uh, so there's plenty of other people that are in his league when it comes to, or in the up, you know, in, in that top part of um, yeah, the top part of artists, comic book creators uh, that do not have the attitude that George does. And that's what sets him apart. That's the benefit of doing a show like this is we get, you know, the whole Superblog team up thing is to, you know, spread the word because people might not know. I don't really know that much about George Perez. I'm learning from you guys tonight about, you know, not, as you said, not only is he a great artist, but he was also a good dude, especially when you hear so many stories about some not so great dudes in the comic book world. George Perez uh, stands head and shoulders above them from what you've all told me. What about you, Al? What does George Perez mean to you? Well, I mean, art, like you said, there's two ways of doing it. There's artistically, which is just amazing, always amazing looking artwork and never a shortcut taken. And if he is taking a shortcut, he's still doing more work than most people do. I mean, he's the person that when he draws a crowd scene, you can tell every face in the crowd. It's not just kind of a nebulous little line to indicate a person and that's good enough. He's putting details into those people and yet it's still not taking away from everything. So... Not only is he one of the top artists, but like Jesse said, there's never really any stories about how George Perez was an ass or mm -hmm. a jerk or having a bad day. Hell, I'm reading this Logan's run, and in the letters page, there are people thanking him from com like from coming in and doing a signing in Detroit and like how awesome he was. Not just doing the signing, but how great he was. So that's not even like it's not even like it was something that happened when. Obviously not just when he found out he was sick, but like somebody even getting old and realizing, oh, maybe, you know, like Scrooge, maybe I should be less of a dick. Mm -hmm. He always was. He just always was that. That's really cool. So what about you, Evan? Um, kind of moving the conversation a little bit further, and, and you can add to what the other guys added to too, but what are some of your favorite pieces from George Perez? Some of his, some of your favorite works? Well, I mean, I, I'd always heard his name among the, you know, like like the comic book legends. When I started really following him was uh, after Heroes Reborn, when they brought back the Avengers, um, and Kurt Busiek was writing it, and then George Perez, who, who was already considered like a legend among Avengers artists, came back and did like a three-year run on it. And um, I mean, to, to me, and I, I, I'm not like, a great art critic or anything. Uh, you you guys have, have seen my, my youthful drawing and it hasn't improved. Hey, uh, don't sell so yourself short. Those free Willy comic book covers you did were just avant-garde. <laughs> they, they were something. But, I mean, to me, George Perez is the ultimate comic book artist because, you know, you've got some guys who do stuff like super realistic and you've got some guys who do stuff really exaggerated and stylized and to me, he, he's got the best of both worlds. Like it, you know, they, they look like believable, recognizable people, but there's always that element of the fantastic. It's just like the perfect balance. And then like, like Al said, I mean, the, the crowd scenes and, and the details, um, you know, my, my entry for the super blog team up is on JLA Avengers. And it's, I mean, it, it, it's just scratching the surface, but I mean, he, he, he spent two years working on that and, like developed tendonitis drawing the cover to the third issue, which <laughs> has pretty much every member of the league in the Avengers to that point. And I mean, there's, you know, there's no silhouettes. There's no just, you know, thrown away character. It's, you know, I, I forget, you know, Kurt Busick's a comic historian in his own right. And he put, I don't know how many hundreds of characters in the script and George Perez threw in more characters. I mean, even people who weren't in the Avengers in the JLA, he was just like, yeah, we're just, you know, like the, the new warriors show up in issue four and Busick's like, I, I didn't put that in the script. Um, <laughs> and Perez is like, yeah, let's, let's go ahead. We need Night Thrasher in this one. <laughs> um, and it's just, I mean, it, it's, it's phenomenal. And um, so, yeah. And then, um, and then like, like they said, you, you just hear, hear the stories about him. You know, it, it, everybody just, it's like, well, yeah, sure. He's, he's a legendary artist, but, but you got to understand the, the kind of person this guy is. Um, so it's just, uh, you know, when, when, when they hit, he announced what was going on with his health, you know, everybody was like, oh no, that's, I mean, that, that, that's terrible to, to hear about anybody. But then, you know, he had such a positive attitude about it. A lot of other people started, you know, lo looking at the positive, like, Hey, let's, let's take time and celebrate him. Let him know what, what he, what he means to, 
to fans and how much we appreciate him while, while he can he can still appreciate it. Reading the Logan's Run comics uh, that he illustrated, one thing, <clears throat> I don't know if you guys, we can go once around with this and then we'll get into the movie, but um, one thing I can take away and thinking back to even when we reviewed um, Crisis on Infinite Earths is that they looked like people. You know, even you, you guys mentioned it before, but I really want to go out of my way and say so much of the comic book world, especially with women, drew them with such idiotic proportions. I mean, they're awesome, Ugh. but um, <laughs> but they're also idiotic. You know, I I, I think um, you know it's it's like Barbie, where uh, if you actually made it made a human being with Barbie's proportions, she'd fall over. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, there were just so many women with these pencil thin waists and gig gigantic bosoms and this whole ridiculous mess. Going through the uh, Logan's Run comics, one of the things I noticed is that while he drew the women sexy, and because that's part of what Logan's Run is, um, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, he didn't make the women look utterly out of proportion to the point of being ridiculous. You know what I mean, Jesse? Like, you know, thinking about like Supergirl. In crisis, she always looked like a human being, et cetera, et cetera. Well, right, Kryptonian, yeah. but point taken. <laughs> Humanoid. Uh, <laughs> actually, uh, there. I will tell you that. Uh, yeah, I, that was one of the things that you'll probably hear me echo when uh, Chris Armstrong and I do our bit uh, in regards. So what to are you doing again? Team match. We're going to be doing Brave and the Bold one through six, which Ooh. came out in two thousand seven, and. You, I, I mentioned the exact same thing that you look at his figures, the the the, the people that he drew, uh, the, they look like people. It's mm -hmm. it's it, it's a comic book, but it's not as cartoony as some other style. Uh, so yeah. it's a it's a it's a very realistic style. I'll I'll agree with you one hundred percent. Um, we want to jump on this at all, Al? You got any thoughts? Yeah. Um. Well, I was just thinking about that. It's right. Not, I mean, he draws some realistic, but it, we're not talking about like one of those artists that draw that like so realistic that it looks like, well, all of us and like has blemishes and like, you know, zits and stuff. Obviously, there are still superheroes characters. So there are, and especially mm -hmm. like Logan's Run, for instance, they're all supposed to be young and pretty. But the way, especially the, the characters like for DC or Marvel, you know, he always drew them the way that you would expect it to be like the corporate logo one. Like this is mm -hmm. like perfect to be. This Spider-Man look. This Spider-Man is perfect to be on lunch boxes. This Supergirl is perfect to be on a poster. You know, he not only did it that way, he also did it in such a way that it was like the perfect representation of any of those characters. It's like you want to know what the new warriors look like? Check out this one random panel in JLA Avengers, <laughs> and that's going to be perfectly what they should be. Evan, what are you working on for the Superblog team up, and and why did you decide to go with whatever it is you picked? Uh, well, uh, JLA Avengers. Um, mm -hmm. just cause I, I, I was going to do, um, I was going to do something from his, his Avengers run. And then that, that was kind of like the culmination of mm -hmm. that. Um, and, uh, you know, my, and my, my thinking on it was, I'm not saying there aren't other talented artists who couldn't have done good work, but for that story and what it was, which was more Marvel versus DC than the Marvel versus DC comic that came out years earlier, it had to be George Perez. To, to do that, to, to fit all those in, to give it weight. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, because he also has a very well-regarded run on Justice League. And even, you know, just in the little bit we've been talking, um, whenever somebody mentions, you know, some a George Perez project, it's always like, oh, yeah, wow. That, you know, it, I mean, it, you know, yeah, there, there's there's a few here and there that you don't, you know, that, that, you, that might not immediately jump out of, as classic, but nine out of 10 George Perez projects. It's like, Oh yeah, that was a high point on that character, or that was a landmark series. Um, and it's not just, you know, it, it's not just because, Oh, they, they happened to call George Perez for the, for the big stuff. He helped elevate those things too. Yeah. I was thinking probably the best example of that would be the, the new teen Titans. And I remember we covered that when the Titans television show first aired on DC universe, when that used to be a thing. And um, I remember talking about the review at the time, Jesse, just how expressive the faces were, you know, like you really you got a palpable sense of anxiety from Raven and, you know, and frustration from Dick. And it's all in the faces that, you know, that he drew. And I, and I always appreciated it about that Teen Titans run. Um, yeah. yeah, he <clears> kept <throat> track of like who was taller. Like if you read Teen Titans, you mm. there's no point where like Robin's taller than Starfire. 
she's taller mm -hmm. and he always draws her taller because that's right. how tall she is like he paid attention to his details which is a you know, mark of a great artist all right so let's take a break from mr the uh george perez here and we're going to come back to his comic but um here's where it all started so logan's run began its life as a science fiction novel by American writers William F. Nolan and George Clayton Donson. It was published in 1967. The novel depicts a dystopic, ageist future society in which both the population and the consumption of resources are maintained in equilibrium by requiring the death of everyone reaching the age of 21. The story follows the actions of Logan, a Sandman, not that Sandman, you nerds, the other, this different kind of Sandman, charged with enforcing the rule as he tracks down and kills citizens who run from society's lethal demand, only to end up running himself. And then this was adapted into a movie. Um, uh, there we go. Uh, so Logan's Run came out in 1976, and it was directed by Michael Anderson. It starred Michael York, Jenny uh, Agutter, Richard Jordan, Roscoe Lee Brown, Farrah Fawcett, and Peter Ustinov. Um, this had a budget of between seven and eight million, and it made twenty-five million for 1976. That's practically Marvel money. So, uh, before we jump into the movie here, uh, the plot, I gotta ask everybody. You know, um, I'll start with you, Al, because initially this was this was just gonna be me, Jesse, and Evan, and you heard we were doing this. You're like, I gotta be a part of this thing. So, what's the big uh, what's the big attraction to Logan's Run? Well, it's just, I mean, it's amusing because it's just so 70s. Oh, yeah. I mean, you watch this movie. <laughs> if no one had told you when it was made, you're like, this is in the 70s, right? Mm. There's no way it's not the 70s. I mean, forgetting seeing who's in it, you just like looking at it. It's 70s. And it's just always something I've known about because I've heard about, I've known about this movie since I was like 11 or 12. Mm -hmm. When I, in an instance when my parents are apparently behaving like you and not paying attention, <laughs> <laughs> I had a copy of uh on a tape of a richard Pryor comedy album from 1976 mm. Ooh, which uh, oh which oh boy one? bicentennial very bad n-word <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> and he talks about the movie briefly nutella yes that's it okay. bicentennial nutella got it yes <laughs> and he talks about the movie brief briefly saying mm. i saw that movie White people aren't planning on us being around in the future <laughs> <laughs> and so that's all i knew about it but it one of those it's like one of those other things you hear when you're young it just sticks in your head so it's always stuck in my head so mm -hmm. and I think I was looking something came up recently like a week or two ago and I happened to be looking up like going I wonder if Logan's run something I really watched it like once and I don't remember it maybe I'll watch it again if it's on one of like the streaming things I have and then I happened to be looking seeing you were doing Logan's run I'm like oh hell <laughs> I read some of the comic I, I, I was planning to watch the movie anyway. So, Evan, you and I, at the beginning of the year, we talked about, like, all of these comic strips that we were going to do. And so when I when when this came up, I was like, okay, well, I got to get Evan Bevan involved here. Had you ever actually seen Logan's Run before? Were you familiar with the movie at all? I, I had not. I knew what it was about. Um, I, I'd, I'd heard, heard it somewhere. Um, I, I think maybe my, my stepdad t t told me about it. He, he, he would tell me about a, a lot of these movies that, that he watched when he was younger. And so I knew, you know, it was... When uh, when you turn thirty, you die, and this guy doesn't want to, so he takes off running. Mm -hmm. And then um, I knew about it from the uh, I knew Marvel had had done a comic, and when we started talking about you know George Perez topics, I was looking at his his bibliography and saw that. But um, that's that's really really all I knew about it. And I was like, yeah, well, this is this is something that's always been in the back of my mind. Like, hey, this is a this is a movie that's out there, so uh, give it a shot. Jesse, I know the only movie you've ever seen in your life is Back to the Future, but um... <laughs> I'm sure you saw part two and three. Yeah, okay, that's three right. movies. That, that's it. Jesse tops out at three movies, and they're all Back to the Future. So, um, as I was proposing that we do this for the Super Vlog team up, when did you learn about Logan's Run? Yeah, wow. Uh, so I know that I've heard of Logan's Run, and I'm uh, very similar uh, to what Evan is talking about here, like where. I knew it existed. I think it was on my list to watch probably at some point, but it is a, it's one of those movies where 
this kind of isn't my bag. Like, I know it's like futuristic sci-fi from the 70s. I was going to say, which part? The 70s? The sci-fi? It's, 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 it's the decade. I think it's more along the, the decade. The and... absence of time travel, perhaps? I, well, you know, he was waiting the whole movie for a DeLorean to show up and save everybody. Where did it? Where? Yeah, and that got that got cut out. Um, the, uh, But yeah, I, I never had a chance to watch this movie. Right. When you threw it, when you threw it to me, I was like, well, you know, I, one of the main things I love doing these podcasts with all of you guys is I get to sit down and do something I wasn't going to do in the first place. Yeah, this is definitely one of them. I would have never watched this film unless something drove me to do so. So that's what that's what brought me into the table. I grew up watching a lot of science fiction and um, space based fantasy, science fantasy. And, um, you know, my dad is a huge science fiction uh, reader. So there was a lot of Isaac Asimov in my house. There was a lot of Robert Heinlein um, for one project I had to do in school. I ended up doing it on Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert Heinlein. <laughs> so, Did you grok it? Huh? Did you grok it or no? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so, th so like, I, you know, like Flash Gordon, I grew up with as a kid, Buck Rogers, all that stuff. Obviously, Star Wars, because who hasn't at this point? But um, Star Trek, Star Trek was big in my house. But this was one of those few that I was aware of, but I never sat down to watch it. I, and I'm pretty sure because my, my, you know, we were one of those like richy rich people who had a VCR when it was the big wooden block. Ooh, yeah. Remember the, remember the wow. big old VCRs where if you press right. eject, the thing shot up Popped like the it was, top. Yeah, <laughs> like it sounded like a cannon going off. <laughs> um, <laughs> Did you also have a separate rewinder? At one point, yes. Oh my gosh! Because you have to be kind. Rewind all that money. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, again, Richie, <laughs> Richie Rich, baby. So, um, you know, we had the big, ridiculous, like, 500-pound VCR. And uh, my dad taped a lot of stuff off of HBO because, again, Richie Rich, we had that, too. Wow. And so he had all, a lot of stuff. Like, I remember going through all my dad's, like, VHS tapes. And um, obviously, there was porn. But I, pu I would push that aside. <laughs> and, and I would find uh, some of the Oh, we didn't see it. And we like saw Logan. a trend. <laughs> he puts the tape in and there's nothing on it. I don't understand. <laughs> um, and Logan's run was one of them. But um, but uh, honestly, I'd never. It was always on my mind. It always had such a cool title to me. I'm like, what is Logan's run? Um, Like, you know, like Blade Runner. That's another one that's like such a cool name. But I don't think I watched it until the sequel came out. At first, I just thought it was about people going to a steakhouse. <laughs> da -da 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 -da. So anyway, um. So that takes us to now. And, you know, I finally was like, this was an opportunity to watch a movie I'd never watched for. I mean, I was like a few weeks old when this thing came out. This is June 23rd, 1976. I'm born June 2nd of the same year. All right. All right. In the year 2274, the remnants of a human civilization live in a sealed city contained beneath a cluster of geodesic domes, a utopia run by a computer that takes care of all aspects of life, including reproduction. The citizens live a hedonistic lifestyle. Arr. But to prevent overpopulation, everyone must undergo the rite of carousel when they reach the age of 30. And honestly, the first time they said carousel, I was like, oh, is this going to turn into a musical? Because the musical. Um, there, there they kill. Um, they are killed. I'm surprised under... there's not a Logan's run the musical. I mean, I, you know, I, a musical I think it's only out. a matter of time. Yeah, oh, yeah totally. got to happen. Um, there they are killed under the guise of being renewed. To track this, each person is implanted with a birth at birth with a life clock crystal in the palm of the left hand that changes color as they get older and begins blinking as they approach their last day. Most residents accept the chance for rebirth, but those who do not attempt and flee the city, they are known as runners. An elite team of policemen known as sandmen, outfitted with predominantly black uniforms, are assigned to pursue and terminate runners as they try to escape. Logan 5 are protagonist and francis seven are both sandmen after terminating a runner to whose presence they were alerted during a carousel right logan finds an onk among his possessions later that evening he meets jessica six a young woman also wearing an onk pendant logan takes the onk to the computer which tells him that it is a symbol for a secret group whose members help the runners find sanctuary a mythic place where they will be safe to live out the rest of their lives Logan learns that the Sandmen have lost 1,056 runners this way, and a lot of good horses. 
The computer instructs Logan to find Sanctuary and destroy it. A mission which it code names Procedure 033, which he must oh three he must keep secret from the other Sandmen. Then the computer changes the color of his life clock to flashing red, suddenly making him four years closer to Carousel. Scared, he asks that the four years will be restored to him when his mission is complete, but he receives no response. <laughs> Darn computers. In order to escape this, Logan is now forced to become a runner. Logan meets Jessica and explains his intentions to run. They meet with the underground group that leads them to the periphery of the city. Logan learns that the Ankh symbol is actually a key that unlocks an exit from the city. They come And to allows him to watch the trailer for Moon Knight. <laughs> they come into a frozen cave with Francis following closely behind. In the cave, they meet Box, a robot designed to capture food for the city from the outside. Logan discovers to his horror, the horror, that Box also captures escaped runners and freezes them for food like you do. But Box can freeze Logan and Jessica. Uh, before Box can freeze Logan and Jessica, they escape, causing the cave to collapse on the robot. Once outside, Logan and Jessica notice that their life clocks are no longer operational. They see the sun for the first time and discover that the remains of human civilization have become a wilderness. They explore an old, seemingly abandoned city, which was once Washington, D.C. In the ruins of the U.S. Senate chamber, they discover an elderly man living with many cats. Meow. His Hi. appearance is a shock to them, since neither has ever seen anyone over the age of 30. The old man recounts what he remembers, which is not much, which is one of my major problems with this movie, about what happened to humanity outside the city, and Logan realizes that Sanctuary has always been a myth. However, Francis has followed them, and he and Logan fight. Logan fatally wounds Francis as he dies. Francis sees that Logan's life clock is now clear and assumes Logan has renewed. Logan and Jessica persuade the old man to return to the city with them as proof that life exists, don't you understand, outside the, do the dome city. Leaving the man outside, the two enter and try to convince everyone that Carousel is a lie and unnecessary. The two are captured by the other Sandman and taken to the computer, which interrogates Logan in procedure 03303 and asks if, his, if he has completed his mission. Logan insists, there is no sanctuary, there is only Zool. When he found out what was old ruins exposed, an old man and the missing runners were all frozen. These answers are not accepted by the computer even after scanning Logan's mind. And the computer just blows up. Now that's a fatal exception error. Yeah. <laughs> causing the system city to fail violently and release the exterior seals. Logan, Jessica, and the other citizens flee the ruined city. Once outside, the citizens see the old man, the first human they have met who is older than 30, proving they can indeed live their lives much longer. All righty. So this is a fun movie. Um, and uh, we'll start with we'll start with you, Al. You've now seen the movie. You've heard my plot synopsis. What do you want to talk about first? What stands out to you most in this movie? Uh, I did like this. I like the outside stuff. I liked how it looked. It reminded me of that show after uh, that was on like what history of discovery several years ago, like after humans or after. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know many, like it would show about how, like if we just vanished today, how long would it take for nature to take over everything and things to be missing and like, just not even yeah. look like buildings anymore. So it reminded me of that. And that was kind of cool. And I understand you were a little annoyed with the old man, but I was just thinking about it just now. If no one lives past 30, even if they're, let's say, the, the new generation is born with when the, you know, five years before they die, I think what Francis was seven. So that city's probably been there for almost 200 years. Odds are he has no idea what happened. Mm -hmm. The fall of humanity happened probably 100 or 200 years before he was even born. He was just living most likely, him and his family were probably just survivors scavenging out there until they found a place to hide as an, intellect, no as an, interne as an, as an intellectual explanation al i 100 percent agree with you as somebody looking for at least a modicum of um oh gosh what's the word i'm looking for where uh no, I, I just i as understand that looking for a modicum of exposition and so that scene plays out like this evan right he's like what has happened to humanity and he is like pretty much kitty cat you know <laughs> and then he well, starts going clearly... to yes elliot which i was i was I, actually with the best part of me the best part of that whole bit is when he starts going to t.s elliot because i was totally expecting like 
cats to start like you know and the and like in him just like spinning around with the cats in his hand going the jellical cat and, uh, 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 and... memories <laughs> clearly the cats killed humanity i i thought <laughs> ever, i mean my <laughs> cats are, are actively working on that as we speak so I, right. you know. the, the old man is the cat's pet i got it all right yeah, yeah. obviously <laughs> once um, they figure out how to use can openers we're done Oh, yeah. <laughs> Look out. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you, Al. I think they did a really good job, especially, you know, for a science fiction movie made in the late 70s of um, one. I think the city looked awesome. Like, you know, so many. And this is something I definitely wanted to talk about. And I want to get your feedback on, Evan, is how much, you know, so many of the movies where they say it's a dystopian future. Um, everything looks like, you know, just run down and destroyed. Everything looks like Escape from New York. And you this know. is all very shiny and new. Right. right. I love that. I love the idea of like, we have created, I love the concept of Logan's run. Whereas, you know, to create paradise, let's just let people bang and eat and do whatever it is they want to do. And then they're dead at 30, you know, violently dead at 30. It's awesome. No one will have a problem with this. And I was just like, what insight into the human mind that is. And so they, 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 this really gorgeous looking, very pretty, especially for that time, you know, awesome city of the future. And that, you know, and then there's that contrast with the horror of nobody gets to live past 30. And if you even try, they'll run you down and shoot you. Um, and then, like you said, you go outside and everything is overgrown. And, you know, it's if you remember the beginning of the movie with the title card. There was a whole thing about, you know, between war and pollution and, you know, global cooling, I'm sure back then. And cats. in cats. We wrecked the planet. And so this was the solution to that, to, you know, kind of a Thanos solution, who we'll talk about in a little while. You know, kind of confine everything to this one space, create a system of, of uh, control so that it's ma so that it's maintainable. Um, but, you, you know, but you have to give up so many of these other liberties um and so but with but they've spent x amount of time under these domes and like you said probably 200 years and so whatever they did to the planet the planet healed itself which i thought was sort of a, a brilliant note you know they didn't walk outside and everything looks like you know the you know <laughs> after the aliens attacked on independence day um yeah because most of the humanity is probably at least in that area is dead right most likely but yeah no i mean i i understand what you're saying about you know wanting that thing it was just i like the fact that like this movie wasn't about that mm-hmm you know, and so therefore they didn't even waste time with it. It's like, yeah, no one knows because, yeah. or at least no one here, if that guy knew, he's lost the, lost that information enough. You know, yeah, that's that, gone that out was, of his head with cats. That names. was made very evident that he probably knew something, but it's gone because he's been talking to cats for the last 30 years. Right. But he's been yeah. alone for mm. since his parents died. And if he right. is like, what, 70? That means his parents died at least 30, 40 years ago. That's he's what I'm saying. So he's just solitary. Been... Yeah. Yeah. But there's a lot of that's like a, a pretty common trope in, in some sci-fi stories where there's been a cataclysm and the story is not the cataclysm it's how people re reacted to it like i remember reading a story in college that was about this one family that was you know trying to survive as society was crumbling and you never once knew what it was that set everything on this d disastrous path because the story was about the family mm -hmm. um so i mean yeah i i, I was just like yeah, uh, I, 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 th I thought the whole point was, you know, what, what life was like in, in, in the city. I honestly, like I said, not knowing anything about it, except, you know, probably seeing an advertisement on TBS at some point. I thought once they got out, got out of the, uh, you know, the, the got out of the city, the movie was going to end. I was like, oh, this is still going on. <laughs> right, there's more. Oh my god, we have, we have a whole other rock left. Yeah. <laughs> um, so playing on to, off of what uh, Alice already talked about, what were some of your thoughts, Evan? Um, well, it, like I said, I, um, I, I, it was, it was not, not what I expected. I, I didn't know a lot going in. Um, yeah, the, the, the city, just that, that opening sequence with, with the city really impressed me. You, you know, nowadays we're, we're used to, you know, you can do anything with CGI and, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I really liked that. They, they really made it, uh, you know, very, very. I mean, I mean, yeah, th there were there were some things that, that showed its age or the limitation of the effects, but but really the the practical effects, I, I thought for the most part, cr created a, a, a good atmosphere. I mean, you know, there were uh, the the guns the Sandmen carried were wildly un unpredictable. You know, you could you could point them at some at someone and you know 
tickle them or blow something up. The gunplay in this movie made the stormtroopers look like sharpshooters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> to be fair, I thought most of the time they were just screwing with the runners and missing in purpose. Oh, Cause yeah. Because they, they seem to be was... having fun with it. So when they're shooting at the... Because you notice later on when Logan's like... When he's escaping at the end, like from mm. the, after he just you know he just makes the computer crazy because he has it what is love or something I don't know and the computer decides to blow up <laughs> right before right after it says baby don't shoots, hurt me but he <laughs> shoots those guys like boom, he's like shooting like three or four salmon like boom 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 yeah he's not missing a beat it's when they're yeah. playing with the runners because they're playing like cats with a mouse oh yeah yeah that, this that movie was, really... was written by the cats you're right cataclysm. <laughs> Yeah. Oh wow, we solved it. Um, it's all the. <laughs> I'm glad I can see that. <laughs> um, but, uh, we I mean... killed Al. <laughs> Al's going to look at the cats. <laughs> you know, I, I, I had even though I didn't know a lot about it, I just kind of had in my head that this was a straightforward movie. Like, you know, guy doesn't care till he's almost thirty. Then he finds out he's going to die, and he runs. Um, and even you know when I realized he was a salmon, I'm like, okay, so he's a cop. It's going by the book. But yeah, the part where they're where they're playing with the runner, I mean, that's that's like twisted. And this is the guy you're supposed to be rooting for, right? And right. Um, and it's it, it's because he 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 doesn't know any better. He's like, well, you know, if these guys don't want to do their part and go to Carousel and get renewed, you know, they're just asking for trouble. I mean, yeah. you know, that they, they had a chance like everybody else and, and they, they didn't care. And then um, so th that and then the fact that it wasn't his time, but he was supposed to go undercover without being consulted by, by the computer. And even a lot of the time in it, I felt like he was still like, yeah, he was freaked out about losing the time. But I, I felt like he was still kind of trying to go go through the mission and um and, and you know, tr try to try to to play it both ways. Um, I, I felt like a lot of the stuff he did, he he wasn't just, oh, the computer messed me up, so screw this, I'm running. He was like, I guess I gotta try to find sanctuary and figure out what to do. So there was, um, I I don't know, it it wasn't as it wasn't as straightforward as, as I expected, and I, I I like that. Now there were some parts that I don't want to say they didn't hold up because I'm not sure how you could sit through them with a straight face. In, in the movie, but but I will say, you know, everybody likes a good, a good movie quote. And um, there's a quote in this movie that I felt summed up the entire film in a way that I've I've rarely seen. Was it, come on, let's have sex? <laughs> no. That's my favorite part of the movie. Just it, him, it, him tiring of Jessica rather quickly and like, all right, let's just go have sex then. Like, <laughs> no, the, uh, the, the one that, that I think really sums up, I mean, certainly it, it's like Logan... You know, even through this gulf of 40 some years and when the movie was supposed to take place, looked into my mind and knew exactly what I was thinking and feeling when they're outside. He goes, it all seemed to make sense until box. <laughs> like, yes, that is exactly how I felt. I'm following you. And then what the heck <laughs> was box? I mean, like at one, I'm, I'm looking at my notes from when I was watching it and I have so mm -hmm. sanctuary is where box keeps animals no and then my next note is what <laughs> <laughs> i didn't get it when i first saw that in the movie i had when reading the comic book and jesse you you brought up this point you can just kind of jump right in here um but i'm reading the comic book and 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 i'm and in the movie i hear him say the stuff about fish and plankton or whatever and again much like all the nudity, I just wasn't paying attention. So I was like, whatever. Um, and then and then there's a fight scene, and I'm like, oh, it must have been time. Like, not even, like, connecting it. Reading the comic book, and the explanation is, yeah, I was a harvester of food, and I would get all of the sea, of the sea life, and I would freeze it for consumption. And then the fish stopped coming, but the people came, and so I kept doing what I was programmed to do. And I'm like, oh, my, that's horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> So what are you They're serving a lot of Soylent Green this month. Yeah. <laughs> so what are you, some of your thoughts, Jesse? What stood out to you about the movie? Okay. Well, yeah, so I read the comic before going into the movie, and I'm glad I did. Uh, like I said, I knew that the movie was going to be something that not necessarily something I usually watch and really enjoy. So um, what I expected from Logan's run was – 
a lot of like future speak. You know how much you love that, Mark. The, the you know future speak and all yeah. this kind of crazy stuff. Uh, these crazy concepts. Um, and they did they say in the synopsis dystopian future? Is that was that the, was it, what is the word that? that was used was um, dystopic something like that? Uh, um, dystopic. Um, keep mean, going. I'll just, I'll just... I, I, that, that's what I think he said, yeah. but I, I don't, I mean, really what's dystopian about this future other than the fact that, okay, at 30, you're dead. Population control is on the minds of people right now. I'm, I'm sure of it. Guess what else is happening right now? We are putting our lives in the hands of computers day in and day out. Okay. Let me, um... not... all right. So let me give you some insight here. So, okay. Um, it was in the description of the novel, and it said it, okay. it, the novel depicts a dystopic, ageist future. And again, none of us have read the novel, to my knowledge. No. If somebody right. has, speak up. But um, I, you know, this this is the description of the novel. The novel may not be uh, as accurately portrayed as we sure. might think in the, in the movie. That's just the way adaptations go. A dystopia, however, Jesse Starcher is a speculated community or society that is undesirable or frightening. And I mean. Just based on that definition alone, if you know, if 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 you're like, I mean, we're all, I think, over the age of thirty. I, I certainly am. I'm. I'm, 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 la, I'm, la, 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 la. I'm working on that. fifty. <laughs> um, so, can you imagine you're twenty nine? Go back to when you were twenty nine and think like I have one year of life left, and like you know, and then think about everything that happened after you turned thirty, good, bad, and different, and how much life you would have missed out on. I would tell you that that's a frightening concept. Yeah, I wouldn't have done a podcast. Yeah, (laughs) there there was no podcast when I was thirty. So okay, well, yeah, then I'll give you that. That that is dystopian when we're looking at it from our point of view, for sure. Yeah, the people living Uh, in it might not have been like, man, this sure is dystopian. Oh, by the the same token, that's the whole thing is with the runners. Clearly, someone, clearly, people were not completely relaxed about the whole. Not everyone was, but enough of them. Mm. Enough of them were just being placated that they didn't even. There was no thinking. I mean, it's what Francis kept say, yelling, saying to, to Logan, like, stop thinking. Why are you right. thinking? Stop My God, how that. present is that now? now? With how, like, the idea of, like, don't don't think, just consume product and wait for more product. Yeah. How what did we learn from Billionaire time? Island, guys? People it's just want a true. prison that makes them comfortable. Yes. <laughs> it, all, right. it all comes together here on the Rattle Engine Broadcasting Network. That's Go ahead, Jesse. Right. No, I, I, I think that when I thought dystopian, I was like, oh boy, this is just going to be, you know, it's a, a horrible future. There's nobody's going to be able to, uh, there's going to be people that are, are suffering and you don't get a lot of that. Granted, right. you might be able to make a, uh, a case for the Cubs that are, but I think they made their own choice. They're out the, the, the kids that are on the outside in cathedral, um, yeah. you know, they're, they're doing oh their own thing over there, but so here's an analog for you to think about demolition, man. That's a dystopian yeah. future. That's what I think that, yeah, yeah, that's what would go in. That, that's what would go in my head, but okay. So, but these folks um, have toilet paper, so <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have the seashells. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the, uh, I'll tell you the, one of the big things that I probably got from this was the character development of Logan. Okay. Mm. Evan, you were talking about how this guy is a, a jerk at the very beginning and he's put in a situation where he has to make a decision as to whether, okay, well, if I, I guess he did, I mean, it's not like the computer says, Hey, if you do this mission, you're going to live or we're going to reset your clock. It's just like, okay, well, you've got like five days and now you got to go. And mm-hmm. he's, okay. If I don't so do it, I'm got, definitely going to die. I, yeah. I, I've got a, a shot chance. if I complete the mission. Right. Yeah. So you watch Logan go from the jerk that he is uh, to someone who can sympathize Mm-hmm. W- with uh, the people that he's hunting. And, uh, you know, that's that's the bulk of what I got out of this. Um, I will tell you, so we've had a big, uh, prior to on air, we were given Mark a, a lot of uh, uh, grief about missing some of the uh, racy parts of this movie, we'll call it. So Copious went, amounts of nudity. <laughs> yeah, there was quite a few. Logan's Run is rated PG. Now, granted, this is 1976. So I went to Google and I said, why is Logan's run rated PG? Because I wanted to know this. Are you ready for this? Here's the answer. I'll read it directly. Why is Logan's run rated PG? 
Okay, these included a longer sequence in the ice cave where Box asked Logan and Jessica to pose for his ice sculpture. Now, you guys will talk. I mean, that, that happened in the comic. Yeah. It didn't happen in the movie. That scene was cut due to extensive nudity and so that the film would get a PG rating. That's <laughs> why it's rated PG. <laughs> because they cut nudity out of it. So, all right, there you go. But uh, all right. So I wanted to speak on the whole idea of like Logan's arc, because that's one of the things that spoke to me is that, you know, he's living. You know, he likes being a he likes being a Sandman. He likes shooting runners. He likes having sex. He likes living this lifestyle that's been afforded to all of these people living in the dome. And he just sort of accepts the parameters of the society at 30 will die. That's just the way it is. But, you know, but he's also been led to sort of a, almost a religious belief that you can somehow, what's the word they use, Al? Um, uh, renew. renew. You can oh, renew. sorry. I'm not That's out. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. One um, of us is. Um, you can call me Al. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, that you, you know, there's always a chance that you can renew. So there's, you know, there's always, you know, again, it's like, it's like any, it's like the Christian religion. You know, I, I might go to heaven. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, that's what I mean. So you hold that out there for people to remain, um, to, to remain faithful to, you know, to the tenants. Um, and, and it's when, when all of that is, and it's like, he's not a good, he's not even a good person until well after all of that has passed. Like he's pretty much driven to complete the mission until he realizes there is no sanctuary. And when he realizes there is no sanctuary, his whole belief system just sort of falls apart. And that's when he's and that's when he's motivated to save everybody else. You know, there's that whole thing where he where he's like, we don't have to live like this. this like they told us the world is destroyed and we have to live this way in order to stay alive. But we don't. You know, it's all a lie. And that's where he sort of ascends and makes the jump you know, to the other side and becomes heroic. Um, but it takes a long while to get there, and you guys aren't kidding. Like he is not a tremendously likable character until no. like the very end of the movie. No, he, he. Sorry, go on. Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say he doesn't. He doesn't really. At least from my side, he doesn't really start to turn until they're underground because he's a re meeting with the the group, and uh, right before the Sandman break in, because mm -hmm. they broke in because he put on his transponder or whatever and told them where they were. It wasn't until really he's trying to get Jessica out of there mm -hmm. when he's starting to care about someone else. And it's like, let's get her, like, can we get her out of here before, you know, the bad, bad things happen, get her back, get her out. And that's when he starts to care about something else other than his own desires. Did he's you still not fully good, at, you know, but he's starting. Let's that's go what I saw. Let's go around one more time um, and and take these opportunities to add in something if I don't ask you about it. But I do want to talk a little bit about Jessica and the, uh, love story because there's a lot about Logan's run <clears throat> that does work for me. I like the themes of it. I like the subtext. Those are the things that spoke to me. That's one of the things I, I like about science fiction is that it deals with a lot of real world um, issues, a lot of real world themes, and then it sort of gussies them up in these really fantastic settings. But um, one of the things that I, for me didn't work was the Jessica character it, she seemed to be more of a plot device than a person. And if it, 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 I think Logan's journey and Logan's pursuit by Francis uh, moves the movie along enough at a brisk pace that it keeps me interested, but I'm not entirely sure his relationship with Jessica does. And I don't think Jessica really comes across as anything more than, the dame, the gal, you know, she she's there as the woman, but there's not much more to her than that. I, I, I think there might be a little bit of an argument to be made of she's the other side of the debate for him, but not not particularly strong. Um, so that's just my thoughts. It's the only, it's really the only part of the movie. Like I said in the in our chat, like I, this is a kind of a this is a very weird movie. But I think I I think the it's weird was the interactions with the old man and some of the some of the other like this showing the renewal and you know the people start going in a circle and like the fireworks going off or whatever it was. Like there's some really goofy special effects in this. But other than that, I think like I said, the movie has got some strong themes. I just don't know if some of the so so much of the movie is Logan and Jessica, and I don't know how much I buy into that relationship. But what do you think, Al? 
Well, I mean, I can't really argue too much about Jessica's characterization. They could, I mean, she mm-hmm. did have some, but not a not a lot. Definitely yeah. nowhere near as much as Logan. Um, I will say, at least for their relationship, I think it's just because for that, that kind of worked for me enough. Just because that kind of seemed to be the kind of relationships they had. In fact, that was probably their relationship was probably the most substantial relationship either one has ever had. Sure. Because no one really has relationships like that unless it's just somebody you're friends with, but a romantic one, it was kind of like, I mean, their whole life is basically Tinder. I mean, that's, a, <laughs> that's basically what that was. She went on Tinder. That's how they met. She, right. met, she was one of her dudes and she went, it's Tinder. Yeah. And he kind of just kept swiping going, no, He swiped no, out, dude no. left. Yeah. It's like, all right, you. <laughs> and that's basically what they live like. So, I mean, the whole, I mean, there's even that whole scene that the whole concept of being a wife and a husband, they just, they right. don't even know what that means. They're like, oh, that right. sounds cool. They yeah. don't get, they don't really understand the concept. It's kind of like when, you know, the 16 and 17 year old who are in love and we're in love forever. This really matters. And we're going to be together forever. And everyone who's over the age of 25 is going, uh-huh. Sure. <laughs> right. Sure you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I barely, like people, they're like, I barely remember the name of the person with the prom with, like, let alone <laughs> who I was dating. It's like, yeah, sure, whatever. That's nice, kid. Go have some candy. And that's kind of where they're at. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's believable for me because it's not a real relationship. Sure. It's just the most real that probably has ever been in that city. So, Evan, you were looking a little skeptical at me. Um, it seems like you have some contrary thoughts. So go ahead and lay it on me. I just, I just look at you like that a lot. Okay. You should see I my know. face in, in the chat when you can't see me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I I thought, um, I mean, yeah, th- th- there were parts of it where I was like, okay, well, th- this is happening a, a, a little fast, but um, they're kind of two sides of the same coin because, you know, Logan has his faith in the way society works and, you know, do what you're supposed to do and you'll be rewarded. Jessica, meanwhile, is thinking, okay, this – this society is wrong and I've got to do whatever I can to help people. And then she finds this guy who she's skeptical of, but truly believes needs help. And her people are like, now we can't trust him. Let's kill him. Right. And she's like, wait a minute. We're, we're trying to save people's lives from being killed just because they're 30 or, you know, deemed, deemed expendable. So they both kind of had their core principles, you know, kind of stripped away and they only had, this other person who, who, who was, was in the same situation as them caught between mm-hmm. th- their, their beliefs. So, so I, I, I can, I can see that they, they connected on that. Also their relationship is more real than my low bar for cinematic relationships, which is Bruce Wayne telling Vicki Vale he's Batman on the second date. <laughs> so, so if, if you can connect more than that, I, mm-hmm. I, I give you a pass. So, Jesse, I really like this movie. Um, I liked it a lot, um, as weird as it was. And, you know, if, like from I said, from a crass perspective, I think the thing that I like about it is what it, you know, is are the the themes that it talks about, you know, the elements of, of humanity that it speaks to. Uh, I, I thought it was very resonant. So sort of wrapping up our discussion here, I want to go. Um, if there's anything else you wanted to add about Jessica, do it now or just kind of go into your final thoughts here. And then Al and Evan, final thoughts. And then we'll uh, we'll move on to the comic. No, I mean, I I had I, I had a good time just like you did trying to uh, interpret. I knew what we were getting had a message behind it, mm-hmm. and I think a lot of it it was it really wasn't too on the nose, other than just hey, we can we can live, uh, and 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 you're just kind of rooting for the the good guy and. Uh, his girl to, to make it through and get through to these people like hey there is a whole life past 30 can I uh, and- let, me, let me jump in here and I don't know if you've experienced this with your own like group of friends or with your own family but I know like my wife you know like we'll talk about you know the vaccinations and masks and the different you know the, the ever-changing very fluid CDC regulations regarding COVID and my wife became like she she just blurted out that's because they want to control us. And my eyes immediately glazed over. Um, I, I tend to not be thrown to conspiracy um, or, or or great organizational controls because I've seen our government at work and these people couldn't these <laughs> these people couldn't organize a fucking you know orgy, let alone you know, a great conspiracy involving a, a involving a 
pandemic, but whatever. And if they but, did, you wouldn't notice it. I shut up, Evan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think their tops are on, so it's okay. Uh, <laughs> I got so you, Mark. Wait. Don't worry. Thank you, thank you, Al. You're invited back anytime, Evan. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, the, to my my going back to you, Jesse. I I wanted to throw this in there because I think one of the things that you know Logan's run talks about is the need for institutions to create controls on humanity, which goes immediately to like my wife's paranoia about what we're dealing with now is all of these things are happening and they're done so in a very purposeful way because they want to control us. And I always ask, but to what end? You know, and in this case, it's a very simple explanation. They're controlling people so we don't wreck the planet. You know, we can, you know, we it, it's about saving the human race. I don't know what the hell my wife is on, but it's fine. Um, um, so, but you know, but you know, see what I'm getting at? You know, it's like there's definitely a lot of anxiety in human literature about governmental control and, you know, the, the fight for freedom and what freedom means to humanity. Yeah. And, and, and you can draw parallels to that here. And like I was mentioning earlier, this is a computer that's controlling things. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, there's, uh, you, you can see some uh, seeds of what our society is kind of gravitating towards. I, you know, I think that uh, we are going to, we, we unconsciously or consciously put a lot of decision making into the hands of some kind of algorithm all the time. Sure. Uh, so I'm sure at some point, you know, in, in the Logan's run universe, which I'm sure there's gotta be a ton of, you know, there's gotta be, uh, there's a TV show, right? We saw yes. that there was a TV show. Uh, I'm sh there's gotta be some other stuff, literature written on this. Uh, there were two more issues of the comic. That's yep. right. That's right. And there so, was a nineties comic as well. I'm not sure how long it lasted, but it was, oh, yeah, that's right. there were several. They're, 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 really? Apparently, Logan, Logan's Run has got quite a few different adaptations. We have the film that we're talking about. Apparently, there was a remake of some description. There was a te television series. Um, there, there was an album of electronica music conceived to be imagined a Logan's Run sequel. That's fantastic. All right. The, All right. Their City of Metal Hammer of Doom. And all, <laughs> yeah, an alternate reality <laughs> game. And then... Um, and then various iterations of the original novel, uh, starting okay. with Logan run, Logan's Run, Last Day. So, yeah, apparently, the, you know, this has been very resonant in well, our culture, whether you realize it or not. I think that the, you know, the big question on my mind is like, what drove the society to make that decision? And it, other than overpopulation, you want to see how that came to be. And I think... Mm -hmm if that hasn't been explored already, that's what I came away with. Like, how did we get here to put our hands into just I have to, a, I have to imagine it's in the novel and they just was like, there's no time. We spent well, two hours on just the guy's run. Uh, they just, yeah. they're like, boom, here you go. And that's what well, uh, I enjoy that about the film too. It's like, mm -hmm. accept this. This is the way it is. Go for it. Go ahead. It was the cats, Jesse. Yeah, well, I think I remember reading somewhere they were going to put the whole origin in, but they realized, you know what? No, we need box. We need more box. Ah, more box. <laughs> Cut out the origin. More box. That's what I look. I, I look. If anyone knows anything about me, I'm all. I'm all about getting more box. Oh, and right. Besides... <laughs> what? Anyway, Al, your <laughs> your final thoughts. I no, look, I, like every time I make a joke like that, Evan looks for just utterly mortified. Evan just slowly going back away from the camera. <laughs> no, no, I don't have wheels on this chair. <laughs> no, um, I enjoyed it. Um, it is kind of scary that some of those things that you can that we're taught you just, we're just talking about now that we're in this movie were from the '67 novel and in the '76 movie, and it's 2022, and we're still like. Oh yeah, I completely can see how that see that. And I understand it wrestling with these things. It's like right. yeah, nothing. It's like the more things change, the more <laughs> they stay the same. It's still yeah. the same old crap. And it also just kind of something to make you think. It's like Logan didn't realize anything was wrong with what he was doing because, like it was said before, that was the world he was in. So right. therefore, why would you? And that's the hard. Sometimes the hardest thing to do is think about something. You know, think get your brain to think about not just your perspective mm -hmm. or not just what you're used to your life. Um, real quick, my last episode, it was me and Christian and we were talking about the story from Marvel comics, 1000. And there's a page of it where they're talking. It's uh, in King Arthur's time. And uh, 
the Black Knight is fighting this person who's trying to f basically fight to live in a land that has no king. And he's like, a land without a king? He's like, what kind of horror is that? <laughs> and eventually what they're talking about is the creation of America. But to right. the guy who lives in a world with a king, especially King Arthur, it's like, a land with no king? What kind of monstrous hellhole would this be? Funny. And who would want to live there? It's so funny you bring that up. Um, I went to my, my in-laws the other night, and we were talking about... So I guess some law got passed about critical race theory. I, I really don't want to talk about that. But um, we it, the it perfect came, platform. I don't it, understand. It, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, well, come for the Logan Run, stay for the critical race theory. <laughs> um, but part of, part of what the conversation sort of dovetailed into was how in critical race theory they'll teach you know that sl obviously slavery is wrong and that anyone who owns slaves is wrong and i was like that is utterly absent of the context of that was what was happening at that time that was normal to have owned slaves in the time of washington was, was seen to be a good thing and like you were seen to be like you're rich and powerful and you know a man about town if you did own slaves and oh by the way not just not, not just those group of people did but and you know, to your point, Al, not, I don't want to get into all of that. My, my yeah. point is like when you, we, we look at, we tend to, we tend to be like my daughter and look at, look at things with modern eyes and forget that back when those things were happening, that was the norm and an acceptable behavior. Yeah. Yeah. You kind of have to look at things, try and look at things with both eyes and try and right. see something in the, you know, it's like what they say, you know, there's what two, all three sides. Mm -hmm. Your side, their side, and the truth. Yep. All right, Evan, I'm going to give you the last word here about critical race theory. Go. No. <laughs> well, um, I, I was happy to see that that box was voiced by an African American actor <laughs> who was also the voice of the Kingpin on the Fox Spider Man cartoon that we're also oh, fond of. Oh, that's so um, here, Evan. <laughs> All this wonderful <laughs> trivia. Yeah, well, I mean, I, 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 th I think I hit, hit on the main theme, so I, I, I'm just kind of go going with my leftovers. Jessica mm -hmm. was played by Jenny Agutter, who uh, we all have seen in uh, the Avengers and Captain America Winter Soldier. She was the member of the World Security Council that Black <gasps> Widow um, oh, that's impersonated. Her? Yeah, yeah, the oh, Black Widow impersonated in Winter right. Soldier. Wow, wow, so this is like so, a backdoor MCU podcast. Fantastic. There, and, there you go. And Charles yeah, um, too. Oh, okay, okay. I, 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 it's it's been a while so, since I watched that one, but um. No, I'm, I, 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 th I think otherwise I, I, I hit on, on most of my points um, with it. Um, I, I, I enjoyed it. it. It wasn't what I, what I expected. Um, you know, um, oh, yeah. And as far as it still being resonant today, um, I'm pretty sure the scene in the lust shop that Mark didn't see at all, some young person watched that <laughs> and was like, you know what? If we put swimsuits on these people and put them on a beach, we could get syndicated all over the world, and that's where they came up with Baywatch. That tracks. Because there was a whole lot of people gyrating in slow motion. But um, <laughs> yeah, okay, awesome. yeah, that that that's all the random stuff that I, that I uh, didn't get to, to work in before. Now I, I I I thought it was it was an interesting movie. I would be curious to find out um, about some of these other adaptations because uh, I honestly thought it told a complete story, and I'm like. Well, how did they do two more issues? How did they make a TV series out of this? I mean, like, this is the story. Well, there's there's the whole aftermath thing, and that's what the comic book deals with. I would imagine the TV show, you know, you could probably dig more into, you know, stretch out that story. Who knows? I haven't watched the TV show. I don't know what and they did. It, but... There are two novels that says afterwards, Logan's World and Logan's Search. Mm -hmm. Okay. That came out, after yeah. the they came out after the movie. So. Well, I'll tell you what would have helped write those novels, gentlemen. I don't know if you know this or not, Jesse. But Amazon Music. Close. <laughs> Close, Robert Winfrey. Um, <laughs> the, uh, you know what they could have used to write those novels? Grammarly. Grammar for you listeners of the W2M uh, network, the Rad Legend Broadcasting Network, Grammarly is offering a free download of the Grammarly software. Grammarly's AI-powered products help you communicate more effectively. Grammarly helps you write mistake-free on Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and nearly anywhere else you write on the web. Grammarly corrects hundreds of grammar, punctuation, and spelling mistakes, while also catching contextual errors, improving your vocabulary, and suggesting style improvements. To download Grammarly today, go to getgrammarly.com slash W2M network. Again, it's getgrammarly.com slash W2M network to download Grammarly for free. Well, if I'm the Brett, the hitman heart of this podcast, I'm going to bring out the my tag team partner, the Anvil. 
Jesse, the Anvil Starcher. <laughs> All right. I like it. <laughs> to take over the reins All of this right. podcast and do what he does best, ramble about comics. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we hopped into the comic side of this by going in and looking at the seven issues of the Logan's Run series, which was uh, Creative Team. George was on the pencils here, and my goodness, who is writing this thing? I had it in front of me. Give me just a second. Oh, actually, do, you, do either of you guys know off the top of your head? I think I Jerry know. Conway was the first yep. issue, and then David Kraft took over. Yep. There we go. Okay. He wrote the next four, yeah. Gotcha. All right, so, yeah, we're, we're, we, obviously, you know, this is uh, adapting the film uh i because it says right at the top official adaptation of the mgm production so really a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight probably isn't going to be uh too much more on top of what we already talked about in regards to plot because this thing follows the movie pretty closely there are a couple things and i i actually have a document that i prepared uh i call it a document Ooh. because it's on a google Did you doc use <laughs> No, Google, Grammarly doesn't help too well when it's, you're just pasting pictures. Well, so. okay. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, you know. But it's hey, a it's wonderful too, product. Yes. It is. Yes, indeed. Check it out. Um, but yeah, so I didn't know what I was getting, uh, you know, with Logan's run. So I jumped into the comic first, read it, and then I went into the movie. And, and personally, it helped me understand what was going on in the movie more uh, just because I have a better, I guess, uh, better chance of absorbing what is actually happening by reading it. <laughs> uh, watching it, 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 sometimes I have to turn subtitles on this house anyway because I can't hear very well over the kids <laughs> watching YouTube. Um, but uh, but yeah, so I was able to watch the wa or read the read the comic book, jump into the movie, and it followed it very very closely. Uh, so let me, I mean, like I said, uh, aside from the. Uh, the plot there isn't really a whole much uh, a whole bunch to add to it so evan i'll go ahead and start with you man you read the comic this is five issues adapting the movie two issues on top of what was supposed to be a continuing series did not continue but uh what are your notes there what do you have on the of uh, on the comic there well i i gotta make a confession um, I, I, I didn't get to read everything. Uh, I, I tried acquiring the issues uh, I, I ended up uh, getting some help from uh, fellow super blog team up uh member uh dave's comic blog um he, he did he did one on a, a, a while back um so i kind of got got the cliff notes version but okay. um i i did notice um i thought the movie did did a pretty decent job of helping you understand what was going on it, it did not explain everything to death but i mean i i thought it gave you the context some of the the narration and captions in in the comic really helped to to flesh it out and it, you know i mean like i still don't know what the heck was happening at at, at carousel but i knew you know they spun around they went up in the air <laughs> most of them exploded um but, I, I believe it's the same machine that willy wonka was using you know with the bubbles and everything <laughs> and the fan <laughs> maybe maybe the city was built on the chocolate Ooh. factory ruins I believe uh, vice that, versa. I, well, you know no. what? That that it could have been converted. It was Willy Wonk. It was it was Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, and it was converted into like biodomes. There you go. He's like, hey everybody, the world's ending. Come on in here. The Oompa Loompas will keep things running. Um, you know, it will kill you when you're thirty. You know, just right. come, yeah, come on in. Come with God me to a world for of imagination where you'll die at thirty. Great head cannon right here. I'm telling <laughs> Thank you. you. There you so go. Um, so you know, I, I thought one of the differences I noticed that that I actually um, did didn't care for um, was Logan seems to we, we get a lot more obviously with comics you get the thought thought balloons and stuff and the uh, you know expositional dialogue um, so it it seems like Logan pretty early on was like. Well, if they can wind down my life clock, I'd better find sanctuary. Um, he, he didn't seem as, as conflicted in in the comic as, as as he was in the movie, or or maybe it was as I took him to be in in, in the movie. Um, so, um, you know, I uh, but it, it was it was still interesting, and I mean, obviously, you know, the the, the reason we we chose this was George Perez, and I mean, it, it's just always 
a joy to, to see George Perez art. I mean, you don't have the, uh, you, you don't have like the intricate crowd scenes and stuff as much in this as, as you do in some of his, his superhero work. But I mean, there's a lot of these, um, I think issue two opens with like kind of a recap and it's this cool, um, you know, these intricately designed panels that, that tell you the, the story up, up to this point. And that, it's that's the, another, it's the ball he's holding. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah that, that's another. That. You stole my idea, but yeah, I'm looking at that oh, right sorry. now. Cause I, no, it's all right. But I'm saying that's what I had. Yeah. It's like he made yeah. the recap interesting. Oh yeah. And I mean, and another hallmark of, of Perez is, you know, you, you talked about there, there's no lazy lines or half-hearted efforts. I mean, he can cram so much story and, you know, writer's dialogue and stuff in, and it doesn't look cluttered or forced or anything like that. And, um, and so we, we got, got to see a lot of that in here. And in some cases with, uh, without any, uh, you know, movie budget or technological limitations, he, he improved on it. I mean, I think cathedral was a whole lot more, was a whole lot bigger and a lot more intimidating than it, than it was in the movie. I mean, I, I was kind of snickering at some of the kids. I'm like, all oh, right, they're supposed to be dangerous in, in, <laughs> yeah. in the movie. Whereas in this, it, it, it was actually pretty crazy. Yeah. Billy, Billy and his, what, what, he had a knife in this one. And I think, what did he have like a pipe or something in the other, uh, in the movie? Yeah. Some uh, kind of shiv. He, yeah. He was definitely <laughs> a lot more threatening in this one. If there I may have been some, comment. some like sag rules or something about how sharp, you know, implements the yeah. kids could be wielding sure <laughs> well i mean i mean he threw the i remember he like throws the pipe at logan in the movie and of course the pipe just bounces off of a wall and in the comic he throws a knife and it sticks right it sticks in there yeah yeah He's it's more... like oh that's that's good stuff yeah. uh I, i'm glad you touched on the art there evan i know that dave uh posted uh, uh you know some clips from the comic and um that so yeah I'm, I'm glad you spoke about that anything else evan about the art anything else i don't want to cut you off there man no no that that was um that that was mostly um you know what, what i wanted to talk about was there were i don't think the movie i mean yeah there, there were blanks that could have been filled in in the movie but i i followed the logic of the movie except for box i i still don't um uh, yeah, but um, I, I follow a lot of that logic. But even the dialogue with with Box helped me un understand him a, a little bit better. In this, I you know he came on screen, and I'm like, did C three PO and the robot from Lost in Space have a baby, or you know what's 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 going on here? Did somebody just go, well, it's the future, we need a robot? I um, love the Box character. The Box character is like, I must sculpt you, <laughs> and I'm totally thinking of like, I'd like you to come over so I can show you my etching. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's I just, so uh, I'm reading the comic, you know, and I'm like, there's no way this is in the movie. There, this thing is in the movie. I mean, when you look at the cover, the cover, I think, what is that issue three or issue four? I can't remember where box. I think it's box on, is on the cover uh, and four. Yeah. Four. four. And I was like, of course it looks so dynamic. It looks so action packed. And I'm like, there is no way this film is going to live up to issue four of this comic. Uh, which it doesn't. I mean, box uh, is he definitely looks like box, but uh, you I know that cover is something design else. Design meeting for box. Like, listen, there's this <laughs> robot that freezes fish and eventually will start freezing humans. It's a really horrifying scene. What are you thinking about the kind of robot you want this being? I'm thinking cheese grater, um, <laughs> <laughs> but shinier. <laughs> yeah, refrigerator with arms and a head and yeah. then there you go and he, he's a little pervy but it's not obvious <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's he's more seductive than all that <laughs> all right you you, Mark, you found box seductive i did I, I tell you he's like i must sculpt you you are fascinating like, uh, i'm all about box is amazing <laughs> all right mark tell, tell me okay. about the comic you, you made it through all seven issues right i did i did tell me about tell me what you thought um, like I said, I thought, so I watched the movie first and then I went back and I read the comic and I thought the comic did a really re great job of kind of filling in some of the blanks, uh, from the movie for me, because like I said, I was able to basically like follow the gist of the movie, but you know, and then there was stuff where I was like, I don't quite understand what's happening here, but who cares? I'll just, I'll just go for the ride. And, and the comic book did a really great job of filling in those parts where like, Oh, okay. Now I, now I get it now. Now I understand why this was this and this was happening here and here and here. Um, I also thought in terms of editing and spacing out, you know, and, and um, 
parceling out the movie over five issues. I thought they did a really, really great job. You know, we talk about structurally how comic books always end on a cliffhanger so that you'll come back and buy the next issue. And if I had, if I had been buying this contemporaneously in the late 70s, early 80s, whenever this came out, I would have, I would have absolutely, even not having not seen the movie, if I had just picked this up in, you know, at my local 7-Eleven or my Tiamo, Jesse, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes al knows what i'm talking about um uh you know if i go to the tiamo and i get you know, my garbage pail kids and i play some street fighter and i buy some comics i would have come back for the five month run for logan's run they did a really really great job of ending each issue with a cliffhanger i thought the covers on these were really great so something i always i talk about you know as long as we i've been doing source material with you um i i you will always ask me about the art and i'm like art you know, I want to talk about the story. That's that's where that's where I tend to key into. But I have to say, these are some of the best covers I've seen on comic books. They're really cool looking. Um, oh, I, it, I, it, I, it comes very eye catching. Yeah, and it comes from an era where uh, the covers, you know, actually reflected what happened in the comic, as opposed to uh, let's get a pinup in sixteen variants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point. So I I, I think that. If you're just kind of walking through, you know, looking at the comic racks, the spinners at your local, you know, um, convenience store and you see the Logan's run, I'll put that up against anything that was contemporary of its time. Any Spider-Man or Fantastic Four that they look awesome. They look mm -hmm. like they're super fun reads. So what? how about you, Al? No, um, I agree. The covers are great. Um, and I did like the like like you said, there was stuff in the movie that really wasn't that important, but there were some things that like. If you're just watching a movie, you're like pausing for a second. Like, what? Why the hell is he just yelling muscle? Is that like, yeah. is this like, you would a, have no idea. Is this like some kind of like anime thing where like you have to yell out, you know, your superpowers, you do it, <laughs> your, your, your attack move? You know, muscle! But, just aim for life. Exactly. But it's like, oh, it's I a left the iron on. And that's why he's sitting there trying to hold his breath because, it, okay, that makes. You know, it just filled in a few little gaps here and there. Mm. I mean, there were some differences, like you said, about how Logan does seem to be a bit more a good guy quicker. And I believe they even mentioned that in the letter column that it was one of the things that they, because uh, I think that said they were trying to take it you know, from like the novel and the original script and what was being done in the movie. And they were kind of combining some things. So some things got changed and that was one of them. Because I think it said, I think they said, and the way they show it is that when he alerts them to where all the, the group of runners is hiding, it's by accident, not intentional. In the movie, it's definitely intentional. Right. And here, it's right. more well, accidental. Um, we're gonna, they did, I, I, sorry, I, go on. I, I'm gonna, we're gonna, I was just going to say, I'm going to touch on that. Remind me. I, I know I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that when we go through my document. That's something. one of the things that I, yeah, that's one of the things that I picked because there's some, yeah, there's some stuff going on there. But go ahead, Al. I'm sorry. But also in the comic, they also did some other changes, which actually several of the letter writers did talk about is the fact that not everyone in the movie was uh well basically you know it was just white people they actually included people of other colors in in the civilization there they were in the they're in the comic so it wasn't just because I, I mean i i was actually looking in the movie because again that's the first thing i knew about the movie so it was something i was looking for i think i saw one black guy in the very end scene really quickly when they're all coming out to meet the old man i thought i saw somebody i was like wait i think that guy is but other than that no but in the comic they definitely put them in there Right. No, they definitely did it there. And speaking of since it's Perez, I mean, besides the fact that he did make those recap pages dynamic, it wasn't just four or six page panels showing exactly what happened. He did different stuff. But also he even back then, he had a great way of doing layout. I mean, issue four, speaking of that one, it's when boxes uh, was it? He's sculpting them. And so you have six panels, three on each side, going down the sides of the page of him monologuing and sculpting. And meanwhile, we have one, two, five panels in the middle of just Logan and Jessica going, looking around going, oh, crap, we're in trouble. This guy's psychotic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. like, so it's like, it's showing, like, it doesn't matter what order you read it. They're all happening at once. Box is doing his crap while they're over here going, oh. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and how often, Al, do you, um, because I, I was thinking about this, how often when you read comics do you actually stop and think about the, the layout? Because when I was going through JLA Avengers, I was noticing that, and usually I'm just like, okay, point, point A to point B. I mean, I you see it, obviously, but I, I don't really think about the structure, and then here's, 
you know, two two different Perez things, thirty some years apart that, that we're talking about. That I mean, may, maybe you're more tuned into that than me. I don't usually notice stuff like that. There's not many people that do. I've noticed that done stuff like that or do it well. I've seen way too many times where they have to have arrows because otherwise you'll have no clue where to go. But Perez is one of the few. Um, Starlin has done it a lot of times too. I've noticed in the issues he does it as well. He's good. At, he was good at that as well, or is good at that. But yeah, Perez is definitely um, already good at doing this, and this is early in his career. I mean, yeah. this is like his first that's, few years, and he's still learning, and he's like doing this. That's, yeah, that's one of the things that you've got to kind of continually remind yourself is that this is I, what I think his career started in like the it was the early seventies, right? I, I remember reading on the, uh, uh, I think it was like on Wikipedia. 73, 74, something yeah, like that? Yeah, so this is not too far out. This guy is still really, ho he's honing his skills here. Um, and just real quick, around the board, Mark, I know you said if you would have seen this, you probably would have bought it. But, um, Al, let me ask you, Al, do you pick up? movie adaptations or were you picking up movie adaptations at any point where you like, oh, okay, I got to get my hands on a movie adaptation. Um, you mean comic have, wise? Yeah. Comic sometimes. Um, okay. Although a lot of them did disappoint in the fact that they felt too rushed. Okay. Um, this is one that like Mark said, they gave it room to breathe. They originally right. said, even said in the other column, it's supposed to be four issues. They expanded it to five and I'm glad they did. Four would have been too rushed. I've read I read the original Marvel Star Wars series, the entire one. And when they did Empire Strikes Back and Star Wars, they both gave them six issues. And that gave them room. They did Return of the Jedi in four issues and as a four issue miniseries. And you can tell, like as you're reading that, like it's a bit rushed. They're yeah. going there, especially as they're going through, like, hey, let's do this quickly. This is fast. Just get through this part because we got to get to the end of this issue because we only got you know two more. Two more pages in issue three to go. We got one more left. We got to get this all in the, out of the way. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of the better adaptions, just because they didn't try and shove their way through in one special. I got my daughter um, about a year or so ago. The um, the comic book adaptation of The Hobbit it is a thick tomb, man. Like I didn't. Is it really? Finish it. Yeah, it's 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 a good size trade. That's what, Evan. Did you ever? I mean, what about you? In the past or presently, you picking up any movie adaptations? I, I usually don't now. I I'm sure I did when when I was a kid. Um, I know I got a. I know I got the the oversized Meteor Man adaptation. Um, <laughs> laugh at Meteor Man. I'm th th that's going to be the next one I, I pester you about, Mark. It's like okay. okay, remember that time I read Billionaire Island? No, I'm kidding. Uh, but uh, <laughs> cashing it in. <laughs> no. Um, but I, I mean, I, I, I remember that. I, I remember getting some of them. Um, honestly, a lot of times I had it in my head that, that the adaptations were just kind of like extra and, and unnecessary. And that, that goes in comics. Although I do have like a huge stack of um, Peter David novelizations of comic movies because, I mean, it, it's Peter David. You, you know, it, yeah. it's it, there's, there's always going to be something extra. But, um, yeah, a, a lot of times I just was like... Um, Okay, if if I've seen it in the movie or the the TV show, I don't need it in in a comic or or book form. You know, like right. I, I I like stuff that adds to it, not not necessarily retells it. But um, yeah, I, yeah. I, that's that's not the feeling I, I I got with this. This was this was something that he you know I would have been interested in, and, and I'd, I'd still like to track down the the actual issues yeah. and go through it. I mean, just just the stuff that I that that I looked at, I'm like, well, this. You know, th th this feels like it, it added a, a, a dimension to it, you know, but right. but usually I, I'm not as interested. Like, I remember watching, you know, Zack Snyder's Watchmen and I'm like, OK, well, he proved that Watchmen could be filmed. Now what? <laughs> you know, I mean, it wasn't like it, it was it wasn't bad, but I'm like, what, what, what did it add? What did I get right. out of seeing this as a motion picture? It was such a faithful a adaptation, you know, it was like uh, the adaption I, of a, sorry, the remake of a Psycho. From the 90s? Oh, the, yeah, the, the, shot, the, the for shot. shot for shot, yeah. And it's like, like okay. Oh, I've seen Psycho, right? Okay, so I've seen this already. <laughs> yeah. So I've seen Psycho. Well, I, so I that, not not a big attra attraction for me, but uh, but this th this seemed like like something special. Well, yeah, and, and back then, you know, 
George is so new. <laughs> That's kind of what I, the impression that I get is like, okay, it's a movie adaptation. They're not going to throw anybody that's a big name on something like that. Uh, they're just going to throw whoever they could get to do some of the work. And I wonder if, I don't know if that's what's going on here. I don't think George has made obviously that big of a name of himself at this time to where a lot of people were scrambling to get the Logan's run adaptation just because his name was on it. Yeah. He, uh, he had started, I just looked this up when we were talking about it. He started as an assistant to Rich Buckler, another artist like, I yeah. think three years before this came out. Okay. So he, you know, he, he wasn't, uh, probably and, wasn't top tier at that point. Well, according, actually, according to the letter column here for that issue four, uh, it says, uh, let's see, Perez is the regularly scheduled artist for the fantastic four and the Avengers. Okay. So, okay. All right. All right. He is new, but I think he kind yeah. of jumped quickly, which is probably why okay. he was not on past issue five. Yeah. Listen to Al, not me. <laughs> well, he does his research. Well, I, the reason I'm asking, and the only reason I brought that up is because I always looked at it, an adaptation. And I was just like, okay, I, you know, this isn't something that's going to really add to the experience, just like Evan was saying. But I do have arachnophobia, whatever issue that was. <laughs> one issue adaptation sitting down here in a box somewhere. So, anyway, uh, Al, I'm bad. <laughs> finish your thoughts i didn't i didn't mean to interrupt you and then i'll just kind of throw up my uh top five or six that i pulled from the comic panels here yeah no i think adaptions changed because i think well a back in the 70s this was really your unless that movie was going to be in tv or reshown this was the only way you had to see these because back i i'm less interested in reading those things now because i can just watch the movie anytime mm -hmm. i want um but back then, like, especially, like, I bought a whole bunch of those novelizations. Like, I still have my Gremlins and Goonies novelizations. because Nice! You know, because I wanted, I didn't have those movies. How else was I going to watch them again? You know, didn't always have, you know, until I had VCR. You know, I wasn't Rattle-Rich, rich, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Rattle-Rich. But I think also in the 70s, I think it also mattered more for them because they did have a lot more adaptions. I mean, around this time, I mean, Star Wars came later, but I mean, they had Star Wars and that basically did help save Marvel a lot. Mm -hmm. But both of these companies, they they both, you know, they did a lot of adaptions for a lot of things. So I think maybe, while they might not have been throwing up their highest profile people, they weren't just picking whoever was, at least my guess, they weren't picking whoever was just there for the day and said, hey, you want to draw a comic? Great, get yeah. to work. Because these meant money, right? You know, they were a guaranteed money, money because the company, you know, hopefully because it was it already had a, a an audience, which is why they had did the Human Fly and Man from Atlantis and other things that we're probably going, what the hell is that now? But you know, we're big in the seventies, right? Well, and didn't um, wasn't the first uh, Marvel DC crossover? It actually wasn't any of their characters. It was the Wizard of Oz adaptation. Yeah, yep. yeah, that's right. That is right. I mean, you can't get much. Uh, yeah, that's like one of the biggest films. <laughs> so, yeah, you're I will give you time. random trivia. Al will give you context. Half of the I, I, I think it's the, I'm trying to remember which form. I think it's the Treasury. I think half of like the DC Treasury books that came out were Rudolph books. Seriously, there's like Rudolph a whole bunch of Rudolph the Red Nosed Ranger, a whole okay. bunch of Rudolph stories. Wow. Interesting. Hmm. Made. Kids bought, hey, what kid didn't love, especially in the 70s, didn't love Rudolph. That's right. There you go. Well, all right. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to throw up, uh, you know, the, the my top uh, few moments from the comics here real quick. And I'll do my best to kind of, I know this is an audio medium, so I'm going to do my best to kind of describe what happens here. Uh, but, uh, and then we'll, you know, we'll get the final thoughts, whatever, and get on out of here. Uh, so here we go. This is, I'm just going, I'm going chronologically, I believe, in order here. Uh, so... First up, from issue number one, one of my favorite panels. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see this yet or not. Mark, yeah, there we go. One of my favorite panels is Logan pointing at a baby and calling it an idiot. That. <laughs> <laughs> that was handled better right in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, not in the movie. <laughs> uh, hey, open your eyes, idiot. Uh, what, yes. what is it with you and uh, and babies uh, in comics? Is you, last last one we did, you were talking about Carnage throwing a baby out a window. I, <laughs> I forgot all about that. That's right. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, <laughs> all right. I think this is uh, – dude, Al, you mentioned Tinder, okay? 
that is exactly <laughs> what went through my mind when I saw this yeah. panel. You know, he's just clicking, and all of a sudden, this lady's like, "Hey, you, you're perfect. All right." It's uh, a very and, prophetic movie. I'm, I'm impressed actually with some right? things about it. Very, very, very on point. Uh, and I think that happened in issue one, I believe. Um, and then I I chose this. I'm going to zoom out a little bit on this. This is the final page, I think, of issue two. Uh, uh, because yeah. it's either issue... Yeah, I think this is issue two, where Francis kills the uh, unfortunate lady that uh, Logan helped... Logan and Jessica helped out. And I just want to... The only reason I chose this was because this was some art right here. This final page, uh, and I don't think I, I'm trying to think if we got any other full page splashes in this series. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of any, but this is the first one where I was like, Look at that! That is uh, that, some great the art. Upside down, like killed woman, there looks, looks pretty impressive. That's right, a, that is a well done piece of business. Yes, and Francis is radioing things in, and Francis has a, a lot of conflict here. I mean, you, you look at just in the movie and in the comic, Francis is good friends with Logan, and I, I, you know, we didn't really touch on him a whole lot, but he's obviously conflicted. He's got this guy who's like, oh, now he's become a runner. I've got to chase my best friend. Even gives him a chance later on down the line. But anyway, as you can see, Francis has killed this poor lady because well, she's a runner. Um, all right. Look at all the, and, the detail in the background uh, on there, too. I mean, you know, it, he, he didn't just like, okay, I've got Francis, I've got the dead lady, job's done. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, this is, again, take, I, I will say that the one thing, and you'll hear me throughout this whole uh, George Perez tribute week we're doing with Super Blog Team Up, you will hear me mention George doing hair and when you look at hair uh in this one i mean it, it this is definitely not as defined as scarlet witch in the avengers in the 90s look at her hair in that and, and george just continues to get better and better and provide much just that much more exponential detail to things uh so anyway beautiful beautiful uh uh page here and then i chose this now al you touched on this and this is what i wanted to talk about as well the impression i got now granted i could be wrong but definitely the when you compare this to what happened in the movie logan alerts uh alerts the sandman the sandmen uh and this is like very it's very intentional in the movie like he is wanting to make sure that they come in there and wreck stuff up on Jessica's partners in crime when they're running. Uh, so it's at that point, you're like, oh man, he's still a bad dude. What's he doing this for? In the comic, it's a bit different. And I noticed the only reason I thought that it's different is because they are immediately threatening him. In the movie, he's not. They're just opening up a door and he's like, oop, he flips his little thing and yeah. bringing the Sandman in. In this one, he's got weapons pointed at him, and he's thinking that they're both in danger. I took it like, okay, he needs to, uh, he intends to like protect himself and Jessica from getting hurt, and that he, that's why he brings in the Sandman. Um, but yeah, I, the, just this one tiny little panel right here on the left hand side where his finger just kind of flips the switch. But uh, Al, did you have anything you wanted to add to that, or I, I, that's the only thing I wanted to say about that particular panel? Uh, no, that's it. I'm trying to see, remember where I saw it, but yeah, that yeah, they do make it here like it's an accident as opposed to okay. the intentional. And I did I did like the better the intentional because it makes you know the you you can see it's not so much the quick change like right away like okay now I'm a good guy because I'm the leader of the movie. Yeah, it yeah, was yeah. kind of you know a grad more of a gradual thing. He's still trying to complete the mission. I mean, it's all about right. it's all about him. I mean, that's even what he whines about in the movie. He said, "Yeah, I kill people, but now it's me." And now it matters. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, what a jerk. Oh, Mark Rattles. Yes. Here you go, buddy. <laughs> I want to sculpt you. <laughs> yes. Uh, can, we boxes boxes like, can we get boxes like Galactus's um, <laughs> Herald? <laughs> you know, there is a Marvel character called Box. I'm sure. That is right. And where is he from? I'm curious, Evan. He's what? from Alpha Flight. 
Thank you very much. I'm so glad we got to work that in here on something that Chris Bailey is a part of. Bailey Super just woke Tebow. up in the middle of the night and startled his wife. But <laughs> someone mentioned <laughs> Alpha Flight. Uh, all right. And oh, yeah. OK, so here we go. Oh, God, this yeah. spoke to me. Uh, way more violent than what we get in the movie. Now, granted, the fight between Francis and Logan is violent in the movie. But, you know, it's definitely not John Wick <laughs> levels of, of of fight choreography. Yeah, I, I was like, wait, is he allergic to flagpoles? Is that why it killed him? <laughs> yeah, just... the, that is my favorite cover of this entire series is him like fighting oh, Francis right. with, the, with the American flagpole. Oh, yeah. You know, it looked like yeah. he's about to go get all stabby with it. I'm like, that's not what happened in the movie, but that's awesome looking. Yeah, yeah. He he straight up snaps on Francis and really I kind of felt for Francis in the book where I was like, Logan is not letting up uh, and he kills him. Logan straight up kills him and it's his face is just like contorted with rage there. You can see. Um, and I think I'm getting to my final panel, I believe. And I, I brought this up. I'm no Evan. I think you may have seen with the human vacuum. Cause that's my favorite panel that you shared from earlier. Wait a minute now. Hang oh, on. <laughs> Drop that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I tell you, that's the one thing that was missing is like they because they do a couple of bits where they have like, oh, we have to call in the cleanup crew. I wanted to see the human vacuum. Oh, right. It was man. It's disturbing what both of those in the comic and in the movie, both of those situations are very disturbing. The one in the movie kind of really got me because right. you, you know, the person's body just kind of melts. into. This I goo. know the bit Ugh. you're about to do, but if you're going to insist on doing this bit, Jesse Starcher, at least blow the picture up so everyone can see it. Uh, oh, you want? OK, well, hold on just a second. Here you go. Uh, so, yeah, this is uh, my final. I think my final panel. A little bit uh, bigger. This. No, wait a second. This is my second to last. Okay. So this is the old man and uh, Logan and Jessica making their way back to the uh, city, I guess. I don't think it actually has a name. It's just called the city. Yeah. But yeah, as you can see, Logan, all the cats, at least I I don't know, I'll say all of them, <laughs> at least five or six of them are, are there with the group. And my specific commentary on this is that there is absolutely no way that you can walk knee high in water with that many cats that calmly. That's yeah, not no. going to happen. Th those Never. cats would have fucked off a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can tell you that it, the cat on top of the old man's head has its claws at least three inches deep. In it. Yes, yeah. Those people are not bloody enough to be carrying those cats through that water. <laughs> yeah. The, right. the cats are thinking we didn't do enough. We thought we stopped them. We let a few survive. Lesson learned. This is what we get. This, this is what we get for granting mercy. No oh. mercy from the cats. They, they, yeah, they just realize the cats realize that there's more people to get. And they're like, we're hanging on. We'll hang out. We're heading to the city. We'll take care of them boys over there. All right. Uh, so, oh, wait, 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 just a minute. I forgot about this oh, one. Here it is. The whole oh, reason Al we have Al here tonight. <laughs> Al Sedano, I, I give you the floor here, sir. It's the final get... flower. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> what happens here, Al? Can you kind of give our, our, our listeners an idea of what occurs yes. in this issue? So this is a Thanos backup story or Thanos versus Drax backup story by um by Scott Edelman and Mike early artwork by Mike Zeck. Um and basically Thanos uh, Drax is just following Thanos because he likes to Basically, it's all he has to do in his life is to go kill Thanos. And Thanos is basically on this planet where there's this one flower that's sacred. And he's there just to destroy it because, well, he's an ass. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, if I can't conquer the universe and destroy everything, you know what? I'm going to just at least screw, up, screw all you people to the point where you're basically just, you know, ruin your entire way of life. Like <laughs> Thanos, if he was Logan's run, would just show up, smash the city and leave. He's right. Like, Done. Out. Right. I I didn't pull the panel that happened at the end of this issue where Thanos, well, close to the end of this issue where Thanos, like, yeets uh, a, a poor mom and her kid across the... Uh, <laughs> they <laughs> just bounce. see him bounce. Yes. <laughs> I want to... I oh, appreciate... A young child in peril. It's Jesse's go-to. I, I appreciate, Jesse, your use of the word yeet. Yes. <laughs> Thanos yeets things. 
Uh, and then, okay, well, here's our final issue, uh, a little snippet that I grabbed. And uh, just because, hey, uh, again, there's a lot of talk about the Eternals on the uh can you uh, please on the blow chat up the as word usual. Eternals as big as you can. We will go ahead and zoom in just a little bit more. A little bit uh, more. I, I almost <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I almost grabbed like that final that final teaser at the at the end of that final seventh issue. Just like, hey, get ready, folks. The eighth issue's coming, and it never shows up. Um, Is that the one where Logan goes back in time? to an undisclosed location in Canada and has his skeleton laced with adamantium. That old man Logan run. <laughs> no, that's the Logan from an alternate reality. Oh, my, my bad. Actually, that uh, apparently is the plot of Logan, of Logan's search. He goes to alternate realities and meets aliens. Love now, it. next to the word Eternals, I'm going to need you to put a middle finger. Thank oh, you. okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, these inside jokes. Um... <laughs> <laughs> but oh. no, like, you know this. This was uh, this was a lot of fun. This comic was a lot of fun to read. Uh, like I said, I really enjoyed. Uh, I, I enjoyed the concept of what occurred in Logan's run, and the fact that we were just kind of thrown into this world. And the comic itself, you know, seeing this early uh, George Perez work is just, uh, you know, it's it's if you can get your hands on it definitely try to do so uh it's it's something to because they're not going to reprint this uh, at least because of licensing and all that so you're probably going to be uh set back quite a bit of money actually i saw some prices on uh ebay there earlier not too expensive it didn't seem like well, it was too expensive isn't the, the thanos issue the most expensive one probably probably jesse Ooh. you know if you're out there fondling people's junk you might find these the people don't know the value of them Trust me, there was an auction immediately after we talked about this during this show uh, within 50 miles of my house that had like seven Logan's Run issues. And guess what? It was online. And sure enough, they were in the hundreds by the time we had like three or four days left in the auction. So I wow. knew I had no chance at them. Um, people were really wanting to get their hands on that series. But um, and I, I didn't even check to see if that uh, Thanos issue was in there i, well, I was looked. gonna say even not even just because of the thanos thing just when you think about how you know it's an mgm property but it's a marvel publishing ish thing right, hey, right. you know you're right these are never going to be reprinted so they really are like the very definition of a collector's item exactly there's, exactly there's only a few of them so it's not like there's like you know like the, the old star wars series from marvel where there's 107 issues and annuals and minis there's seven that's yeah. it yeah. and then you're yeah. done it's kind of too bad. I mean, I would have liked to have seen where they went with this, especially since it seemed like they probably, since unlike Star Wars, they didn't have to kind of like tread water between movies. They could have actually done something with this thing, property. They could have done I, something. I think Logan would have ended up in the new Warriors with Safe Space and Snowflake. <laughs> actually, <laughs> he almost could have. Hey, There's hey Chris the Bailey, list. thanks for coming up with Super Blog Team Up. We're going to talk about everything you hate. <laughs> There's actually talk in the letter columns. People are saying that the history they give in for Guardian, the original Guardians of the Galaxy, this history kind of worked like the Logan's Run could actually work in their history of like oh, what wow. they said about the 22nd, 23rd centuries. And they were even asking people, it's like, well, the other ones like Planet of the Apes doesn't work here, but like, would you want to see this part of Marvel continuity? I mean, Conan is. Yeah. Right. right. Conan well, is, now, um, is now, and he was back then too. Conan was part of Marvel history. You, you put that out in the universe. I'm going to laugh if Logan ends up in Guardians of the Galaxy three. Well, didn't um, wasn't the uh, War of the Worlds sort of part of the Guardians of the Galaxy history at one point? Like, cause Kill yes. Raven. Yeah, yeah, he's okay. fighting the Martians. That's that's what happened. That's the Art Guardians of the Galaxy history. The Martians yeah. come and invade against the Martians, like from War of the Worlds at the tripods. You know, you bring and up. Then, Hang on, you bring up Guardians of the Galaxy. You know what my favorite part of Guardians of the Galaxy was? The music. Miley Cyrus? Yes. Laser face? Yes, the music. And do you know where you can listen to all of the music from Guardians of the Galaxy for free for 30 days, Al Sedano? Oh, uh, no, well, tell me. I will. <laughs> you, can, <laughs> you can get it from Amazon Music uh, Unlimited. We happen to be giving away a free 30-day trial of the Amazon Music Unlimited 
service at getamazonmusic.com slash W2M network. That's getamazonmusic.com slash W2M network for your free 30 day trial of the Amazon Music Unlimited service. You try it for 30 days. You can download as many of the songs that were in the Guardians of the Galaxy movie or the Suicide Squad, which copied them or Peacemaker, or anybody else that's currently using pop music in their comic book property, or anything else that's even not related to a comic book. I mean, I don't know what else is out there that isn't related to comic books these days, but I'm sure you'll find something. And you can listen to it on AmazonMusic.com um, and click our link, get AmazonMusic.com slash W2M Network. If you like it, you keep it, you pay the, thir- the uh, monthly fee. If you don't, you can get rid of it. No fuss, no muss, no contracts. Hey, guys. We're almost at two hours. I had a blast of a time. I'm glad we did this. I'm always up for talking about new and fun things that, you know, that everybody on Earth isn't covering. Marvel! Um, so, you know, so I was glad to, to have you knowledgeable comic book people here to have some fun with me with this little sci-fi movie that I, I probably people don't even, even know or remember at this point because it hasn't been remade into a, into a modern movie 86 times so thank you thank you evan bevins for hanging out with me tonight oh that was my my cue to talk and plug stuff at at least acknowledge that i talked to you yes yeah thank you mark for talking to me and acknowledging me (laughs) and not cutting me off after the 18th joke about how you didn't notice nudity in the movie (laughs) no problem um (laughs) Well, where'd everybody go? <laughs> uh, Al, you know, um, didn't plan to have you on, but I was always happy to have you. I hope you'll um, continue oh, just to like my parents. Out. Didn't plan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope you'll continue to check out what we're doing on the schedule. And when you see something that tickles your sack, you're like, hey, meet you and need to include me. And unless, you know, you're feuding with that per- the, the fe- person on that podcast and I can't let you on, I'll be more than happy to have you. Oh, great. Now I got to figure that out. Crap. There's too many. <laughs> yeah. <shows. laughs> yeah. The Rattle Legend Broadcasting Network is kind of like a, like, like an, um, like a wedding now where you have to figure out who to seat at what table. Um, <laughs> I, I might take you up on that. Maybe in, I don't know, 24 hours. That's right. You'll be back <laughs> again tomorrow with someone you're not feuding with uh, and someone who didn't mind having you on the podcast. That's uh, good enough for me. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. <laughs> Jesse Starks here. You're my hetero life mate and a pretty cool fruit who really knows where his towel's at. You know that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. It was a fun time here, man. We had a really good time. Are you ready for plugs yet? Um, let's get to it before we blew it. And, why, and since you uh, you threw the word out there, why don't you do the plugs? All right. Well, hey, you know, ladies and gentlemen, check out the Super Blog team up. My goodness, we have all sorts of things coming at you for the Super Blog team up in regards to George Perez. As a matter of fact, I have a listing here somewhere that I'm going to find that has all of the contributors. And um, I will find many that. Many of them are included in the description of this podcast that I saw okay, on the right. Brave and the Bold podcast. I love it. I love it. So Mark's already got us covered there. Just, hey, go to Twitter, type in hashtag SBTU or Superblog Team Up. Go to Google, do the same thing. You're probably going to be able to find us pretty easily there. And everybody who's you know, participating in this has got some great work. Evan's, you know, participating in it. I've got my own show going on here. Uh, So uh, I know that uh, everybody else has got some great stuff to say slash write. So please absolutely 100% check that out. And, uh, you know, anything else on the Rattle Itch and Broadcasting Network that I'm a part of, including Unspoken Issues, fo- focuses on the 90s comics, uh, feel free to check that out. And I know for a fact that we are going to be talking about, I just got to get the uh, the episode edited, and unfortunately, it's not making it in time to be part of the SBTU, but... Dean Compton, Derry Waite, and myself talked about Avengers Squadron Supreme. There was an annual and two issues where George Perez nice. came in there and mm-hmm. tore things up. So uh, get it, keep an eye out for that. That's got to get edited. That'll be coming up here probably within the week. Uh, so uh, a lot of love for George Perez. I, you know, I, I, I can say once again that it, this is a, a – it's, it's heartbreaking what he's going through and what he's had to actually face – uh, but I will say that he's done it with the utmost dignity and the uh, amount of <sighs> heartfelt appreciation for his work and the words that are going to be said about this man will not only uh, they're just going to continue on for the rest of our lifetime. Um, and it, it's good that he 
I'm glad that he gave everybody the opportunity to appreciate him while he is still here and that we have had the opportunity to do this super blog team up and come together with, uh, you know, our friends who who've read George and uh, enjoyed his work and talk about it. So, you know, it's been a pleasure to sit down here with you guys tonight and, and talk about some of his really early work, which, you know, again, I would have never, I would have never even, Gave it a second thought, uh, other, than, other than to actually have the chance to sit down and talk with you guys and talk about his legacy. So that's all I want to say, Mark. Alf Dano of the Resurrections Warlock and Thanos podcast. Tell him about the Resurrections Warlock and Thanos podcast that you talk about Warlock and Thanos <laughs> podcast. Yep. So yeah, it's a <laughs> podcast about the Marvel characters Adam Warlock and Thanos, and it's right there in the name. I mean, I'm not sure what people are confused about. It's right there. <laughs> so. Go to Twitter at Adam Thanos Pod, uh, or just type in Adam Warlock or Thanos from whatever podcatcher you use. It's gonna pop up. Thanks for coming on, Al. Take me home, Evan Bevin's baby doll. Well, um, my blog is uh, asterisk51.blogspot.com. Um, like I said, uh, for the Super Blog team up, I'll be uh, talking about the JLA Avengers uh, and George Perez, and then once I'm um, suitably, you know, have a safe distance from Perez. I might put some of my own, uh, retro art up there. Um, and, uh, I like to, uh, you know, touch base on, um, uh, ho holes in my comic collection that I'm filling, uh, movies that I've watched or bought at family dollar. Um, and, uh, just about you know, whatever else I can, uh, I, I can come up with that. I think at least somebody else out there might be interested in reading about. Rock on, man. All right. This week was a busy week. We had not one but two Scream reviews. Uh, I did the traditional Damn You Hollywood with Ronnie Adams of the Screaming Boy podcast and um, and Robert Winfrey of the 401mania.com. And then Jason Teasley went into business for himself. He had his lovely wife, Amber, and Alexis Haina do a further roundtable discussion of Scream 2022. Both of those shows are now up in the archive. Tomorrow, as Al mentioned, he will be joining myself and Ronnie Adams of the Screaming Boy podcast uh, to talk Hawkeye season one. So that'll be up for you. Um, what time is that show? 10 o'clock. Oh, oh, okay. Just checking. Uh, making sure. I, I wanted to make sure Ronnie heard. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> wah, wah. We'll also have a re-airing of Ozark season two. Friday, we'll have a re-airing of Battle Beast, No More Hollywood Endings, to coincide with the release of the new Battle Beast album, Circus of Doom. Um, uh, Whitney Seibold of Critically Acclaimed and IGN will be coming on to talk Nicolas Cage's Mandy with me. And uh, speaking of the protocol son, Jason Teasley, he wormed his way into a review I was just doing with Jesse. Jesse and I were going to have fun with Anna Kendrick and a, and a sex doll. Uh, we were going to talk. Whoa, some whoa, whoa. <laughs> you put it that way. <laughs> what? Um, <laughs> phrasing. Um, so we were going to talk some dummy and, uh, and Jason Teasley said, what about me boss? And then he watched the show and said, why me boss? <laughs> um, <laughs> so doesn't matter what he thinks though. I want to talk about Anna Kendrick and a sex doll. So we're going to be talking the former Quibi show now currently on the Roku channel dummy. And that's going to be, um, uh, Friday night. Yes, Friday night. So we've got Battle Beast, Mandy, and Dummy. And then this Saturday, um, we'll have uh, a re airing of Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll season one. Plus, Dan Lasby and I are finally getting together for the first time in 2022. We are not doing any boxing because there's no good boxing to be had that we can cover, but we are, in fact, going to be covering the UFC heavyweight title match between um, Francis Ngannou and Cyril Gaon. Uh, the entire main card of the UFC 270 event. Uh, so from 10 to 1 or whenever it ends, you'll have me and Dan Lasby doing a live stream. That'll be a lot of fun. We're going to get back into the swing of doing Saturday night live stream for live fights again. Um, I'm trying to encourage him to get to zone so we can start covering those fights because apparently there's not a whole lot happening anywhere else. The zone announced a whole bunch of fights, though. So I'm trying to get some of those covered. Uh, the ones that aren't happening in Europe when I'm working. I have the worst timing ever. All right, so that's it. That's our super blog team up um, entry. Uh, comic strip Logan's Run for Al Sedano, for Evan Bevins, for Mr. Essential Jesse Starcher. I'm Mark Rattledge. Be well, be safe, and behave.